Well, I have to apologize up front. Um, I almost thought about, instead of doing a sermon on Habakkuk, doing a, a 10 reasons why not to smoke, um, because my voice is just about gone. <laughs> so um, I'm going to kind of go through it. If my voice drops out, I apologize. But I'm really excited to go through the book of Habakkuk with you guys. So if you guys have your Bibles, if you would turn to Habakkuk. Um, and then we're going to look at chapter 3. And we're going to be looking at verses 17 through 19. So, <clears throat> okay. you guys there? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Actually, I'm going to ask somebody to read Habakkuk chapter 3, verses 17 through 19. Can someone stand up and read that for us? I know it's really daunting. Chapter 3, verses 17 through 19. Derek? Or, you're losing it. Okay, Jeremiah. <laughs> pray, guys. Heavenly Father, I pray tonight that as I bring the word that you would help me to have clarity and understanding in presenting it. I pray that you'd help me to um, get out of the way so that your your word may be presented and the glory of the gospel would be shown. And I pray this in Christ's name. Amen. The year is 1971. Uh, The former lead singer of the Beatles, you guys may know him, John Lennon, you're familiar with him, released his one-hit wonder, and it is by definition a true one-hit wonder, Imagine. It was said that he performed the song in only one recording session, and it became the, one of the most popular, most influential songs of the 20th century. <clears throat> in fact, it made to the top of the list by Rolling Stone, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, the Grammy Hall of Fame, and the Guinness World Records. It would be, go on to be sung and re-released by like Madonna, Elton John, Stevie Wonder, and Lady Gaga. Um, This is a song that really won the hearts of the American public. Um, It was during the fragmenting of American society. You had the Vietnam War, the sexual revolution, the continuous struggle with the USSR, the battle with the atheists and the fundamentalists, and the racial tension all throughout America. And John Lennon imagines a world of peace, a utopian society without God and without religion. And because of that, he thinks if there's no God and religion, then there would be no injustice, evil, and suffering. Here's what he imagines the perfect world to be. He sings this. Imagine there's no heaven. It's easy if you try. No hell below us, above us only sky. Imagine all the people living for today. Imagine there's no countries. It isn't hard to do. Nothing to kill or die for. and No religion too. Imagine all the people living life in peace. You, you may say I'm a dreamer. But I'm not the only one. I hope someday you'll join us and the world will be as one. You see, John Lennon's ultimate solution to evil and suffering and injustice was to get rid of God. He did, and, and, and many other people like Richard Dawkins in his book, The God Delusion, writes that the, the solution to evil and injustice when we are confronted with it is, if God is so good and powerful, why can there be evil and suffering in the world? Why is it here? And so these people like John Lennon or Richard Dawkins or many people or even you yourself in the audience today have come to the conclusion that there must be no God, that religion is a dangerous thing, that we should have nothing to do with it. You see, when we come up against suffering on account of injustice and evil, I think we're tempted to go away with God. We react in many different ways by abandoning our faith, maybe ignoring the injustice, pretending it's not there, blaming God, or simply choosing to believe that God is dead, or quote-unquote, he doesn't exist. So what I really want to talk about today is how do we confront this problem of evil and justice all around the world, the mass shootings, the sexual abuse, the genocide, the persecution, or maybe the little injustices that you face every day on campus or around you, the sins of other people slandering you or hurting you. How do we deal with this? There's so much evil and suffering, you are tempted to doubt God, where are you? You are a good God. Where is your justice? Where are you? And like John Lennon or Richard Dawkins, we sometimes may be tempted to come to the conclusion, let's just forget about God. 
Let's just do away with him. That's the best we can do. So the ultimate question of application is, what do we do when we're confronted with evil and justice? You know, we may think that God's slowness to wrath is a bad thing, when in fact it may be a gracious thing. I'm going to look at uh, 2 Peter real quick um, before we jump into Habakkuk, because I think Peter is speaking to his audience at this time, his second letter, about kind of the same situation where people are doubting God's goodness. Where is God's justice coming? When is he going to come and make things right with the world? Peter writes this in chapter 3. I don't have it in the U version notes, but you guys can listen. This is now the second letter that I am writing to you, beloved. In both of them, I am stirring up your service mind by way of reminder that you should remember the predictions of the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior through your apostles, knowing this first of all, that scoffers will come in the last day with scoffing, following their own sinful desires. They will say, where's the promise of his coming? But do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but all should reach repentance. What Peter's saying here is, there's the temptation, right? People around us, like John Leonard Richard Dawkins saying, where is his coming? Where is his justice? Where is God? It doesn't even exist. And in between the first coming of Christ and the second coming of Christ, we are confronted every day with evil and injustice and the constant temptation to think God's never going to come. He's never going to come through. The day of the Lord, like, we, like I talked about a couple of weeks ago, isn't going to come. Well, I like what Peter says. He says, remember the predictions of what? Of the holy prophets. So we're going to do just that. We're going to go back to a one-hit wonder that was written many, 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 many years ago written by the prophet Habakkuk, who, like John Lennon, saw the injustice and evil around him and was confronted with it and doubted God's goodness. But he comes to a different conclusion than John Lennon. Instead of abandoning faith in God, he actually is firm in his resolve and faith with God. So I want to turn to that. With Habakkuk, kind of the goal is I want to go through quickly the structure of the book. Um, one of the benefits that I've really gained from this uh, semester study is just being able to break down the book in sizable chunks to kind of chew on and meditate. Um, you know, when you pick up a book of the Bible, and it's just like, oh my goodness, <laughs> like, what are we going to do with this? I don't even know where to start. So I just kind of want to break it up for you guys. It should be in the U version outline. Um, take notes if you want to because this is just the beginning. I can only explain the book so much in 30 minutes, and also with a voice that is barely working. So uh, I encourage you guys to really take this as the launch pad to go into studying the book into more depth. But Habakkuk was written um, during the time um, after King Josiah's death. That's the belief, that belief that the scholars believe it was written. If you remember, Nathaniel preached on Zephaniah, and Zephaniah was written during when? time of Josiah's reform. But even then, the people were indifferent, right? They did not care about their sin. They were corrupted. As Nathaniel was saying, they didn't believe that God would do ill or good, that God didn't care. Almost like a deistic sense. God made the world, and then, hey, he's going to do his own thing. That was the idea this time. We can imagine after Josiah's death that things only got worse, okay? The one king who was seeking reform was now gone, and it was building up to the moment. A new uh, kingdom, a new nation, I uh, probably would have made the headlines in that day. It was called Babylon, okay, or the Chaldeans. And they were rising up. Okay, they had taken out Assyria, or the Ninevites, right? If you remember a Shandy sermon on Nahum, that was now being fulfilled. Okay? And now they were coming in. They took out Egypt, and they were beginning to become a huge, powerful kingdom. So Babylon's on the road. And if you remember, Nebuchadnezzar is the king of Babylon during this time. Uh, if you remember him from the book of Daniel, right, or the, the Veggie Tales movie where, you know, he had the chocolate bunny, you know, worship. That's not the true historical account, but that is the same king that is actually during this time, okay, is King Nebuchadnezzar. Well, Habakkuk is seeing the injustice. He says in chapter 1, he, he, what we see what's interesting about Habakkuk actually is that it's a prophecy that's a dialogue. So most prophetic books are, you know, a proclamation or a declaration against Judah, Israel, or another kingdom. But what Habakkuk is, it's, it's an intimate conversation or prayer between Habakkuk and God. 
So what it is, is, is Habakkuk comes to God and prays and says some things, and then God responds. It's a dialogue for us to see. So we get a sneak peek into this prophet's inner workings, his mind, his emotions, how he's feeling, and how he comes to God. And one of the things that Habakkuk is struggling with is the injustice and evil of Judah, the corruption that is growing and growing. And he says here, he says in chapter 1, O oh Lord, how long shall I cry for help? And you will not hear. Or cry to you of violence, and you will not save. Why do you make me see iniquity, and why do you idly look at wrong? So Habakkuk's crying out to God, Lord, you are a good God. You are a just God. So why do you allow this corruption, this oppression, this violence in our country? Why don't you do something about it? Well, Habakkuk makes this first complaint, and then God responds in verses 5 through 11. He says, Habakkuk, he goes on, look, see, behold, he's raising up Babylon, this powerful nation, this violent nation, okay, this nation that's going to come and sweep Judah and destroy them. And eventually they would, right, in 586, they would come and they would destroy Judah. Well, then Habakkuk, right, in verses 12 through 17, he says, hold on. Okay, God, let me get this straight. I just prayed to you saying, Judah's evil and corrupt. We need your justice. And you're going to send Babylon as your instrument of justice. Hold on, Babylon's way worse <laughs> than Judah. How can you use evil and suffering to bring a greater good? That doesn't make any sense. He describes them. He's like, he's like are you not from everlasting, my holy one? You have ordained them. You have, you have established them for reproof, but it doesn't make sense. And so Habakkuk goes from looking at his nation's corruption to now being like, what about the whole world's corruption? Not just Judah, but what are you going to do about all the world's corruption? Their evil and their wickedness, their rebellion. What are you going to do about that? He describes them like a fisherman who have their dragnet. They throw in a dragnet. was like you know, a, a fishing net that you would cast out, and it was weighted, so it would just sweep you know, on the bottom ocean floor and sweep up all the fish, right? Well, Habakkuk describes that on the scene. They're, they're sweeping up all the nations, Egypt, Syria, everything in the Middle East, and eventually they were going to come for Judah. And Habakkuk's like, is he then to keep on emptying his net and mercilessly killing nations forever? And then he says in chapter 2, verse 1, I will take my stand on my watch post and station myself on the tower. And look out to see what he will say to me. So he waits on God's response. What is he going to say? Well, God responds. And this is where we, this is the, the God's direction in chapter 2, verse 2, is where we get the book of Habakkuk. God says, write the vision. Make it plain on tablets so he may run who reads it. He says, for still the vision awaits its point in time. It hastens to the end. It will not lie. It seems slow. Wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. This is a great companion piece to 2 Peter because it's this idea of why is God so slow to bring justice, right? Why is God so slow to make things right? And we're talking about this time before the day of the Lord ultimately comes that he's struggling with. And then God says, behold, his soul is puffed up, verse 4, um, chapter 2. It is not upright within him, but the righteous shall live by his faith. So God says, all who are proud, all who are rebellious, all who are wicked will be brought down, but the righteous will live by faith, right? We've talked about this, that Nathaniel and I we've, and Shandy, we've described this over and over the last couple of weeks, that if you're on the day uh, of the Lord as judgment, it's because you're rebellious, you're wicked, you're, you're not repenting. But if you're seeing the day of the Lord as salvation, right, it's because you are turning to God, you are repenting to God. So God says, this will be known. So he brings a charge against Babylon, he brings up five different woes, okay? Five different problems that Babylon has done. And these are some of the same things that Judah is doing, but maybe to a lesser degree, maybe not as severe. But nonetheless, we're going to see what the problem is and why they will be destroyed. God brings up the problems, and I won't go through all the verses, but um, he brings up that they have greed, they have ambition, oppression, exploitation, the so slavery, they're, and then the idolatry for the end because they worship their success. Habakkuk says he casts his dragnet out and then worships to it, worships his success. He's proud. He thinks he's God. He thinks he's righteous. They think they're right. But those who have that mentality will be brought low. And then God says in verse 20 of chapter 2, 
but the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. So God says, be silent, wait before me. And Habakkuk responds, and Habakkuk says, O Lord, I have heard the report of you in chapter 3, verse 2. In your work, O Lord, do I fear. In the midst of the years, revive it. In the midst of the years, make it known. In wrath, remember mercy. So Habakkuk now prays to God, just please bring, bring, please bring justice. But then he also prays that he would bring mercy. In your wrath, remember mercy. And then he remembers, he recounts the splendor, the majesty, the glory of God. And in the, the middle part of chapter 3, he then brings to attention this idea of the exodus, how God had delivered them way back beforehand from the slavery of Egypt. He says, oh, Lord, in, in, in verse 13, you went out for the salvation of your people, for the salvation of your anointed. You crushed the head of the house of the wicked, laying him bare from thigh to neck. So he's like, God has acted in the past. God has made things right, and he will. And then we see his resolve, um, what Jeremiah read, verses 17 through 19. Though the fig tree should not blossom, though justice should not come yet, though I must wait on God, still I will rejoice in him. Still I will trust in him. Well, that's pretty much the whole book of Habakkuk, but I wanted to bring up six application points. Six application points for application. How to deal with injustice and evil. And Habakkuk is a great, well, there's a lot of good application here because it really shows us how to confront and how to deal with it. Because we all are confronted by it and we all have this crisis of faith and is God really there? Is God really listening? Does he really care? If he's so good and powerful, why, why does it seem so slow? Why is he not acting out and making things right? Well, I think there's two ways that we come across suffering or injustice or evil. One is we just don't care. And the world sees us complacent and indifferent. We just, we just don't want anything to do with it. We become cold-hearted, hardened, calloused, we become cynical, and we emotionally cut that part out of us. Okay? Or, on the flip side, we are driven to such a despair and a depression we give up our faith. We can't handle it. We don't wait enough for God. We say, I can't deal with this anymore. I'm going to let it go. I don't think those are the only two ways, but I think those are the ones that I think really stick out the most. Is when we come to a crisis of faith, right, we react one of those two ways. Or the third, the best way, is that we follow God and we put our faith in him and we grow in that. And that's what we're going to really hit on tonight. So the first thing we learn is we should care and grieve, okay? We should care and grieve. Number one, we should care and grieve. What do I mean by that? Well, look at Habakkuk. He's crying out. He says, oh, oh Lord, how long shall I cry for help? This is something that's been going on for a long time, right? He's crying out to God. This is just now the little inside look we have at his prayer life, but I can only imagine how much he's prayed. Okay, so that's Habakkuk, right? Now, what about his audience? They're the same people that, 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 that Nathaniel was talking about in Zephaniah. Indifferent, complacent. Eh, I don't care. I don't see what's wrong. God's not going to do good or ill or whatever. What we see here is people who have become hardened by their sin. They don't grieve and they don't look at the suffering and they say, eh, whatever about it. Are we indifferent to evil and suffering in the world? Do we turn a blind eye to it? We treat it like the status quo, like it's okay. That this is what's going on. This is just life. That sin's not that big of a deal. Let's get really serious here. What about the sexual abuse in churches? How many pastors, how many ministers, how many of us turn a blind eye? We don't grieve it. We just treat it as normal. Or the pornographic addiction that funds sex trafficking. I'm indifferent to it. I don't care about it. We become cold and hearted. What about the mass shootings we hear or the genocides or terrorist attacks in other countries? Do we pray for them or the persecuted? Do we grieve that or we come too cynical and hardened? Do we make fun of the sin and the injustice and the evil in this world? Because you see, if 
the people of God don't care or they don't grieve that, what do you think the world thinks? Man, it's not true love. They don't care. They're indifferent. You know, when, when you lose a loved one, you grieve, right? It's the natural response. Now, we all grieve in different ways, but nonetheless, you grieve. When sin happens, when evil and injustice happens, shouldn't we care? Shouldn't we, shouldn't we have emotional reaction? That's what's happened in Habakkuk right here. He's emotionally responding to this. When the people of God don't cry out against injustice and evil, the world doubts the validity of the love of the gospel. Now, I don't mean when you cry out that you become hateful towards the sinners. I'm saying that you are saddened by the state of what sin has done. We need to wake up. And when we don't have a true grief over it or a sorrow over it for others and ourselves, it means that we're spiritually dying inside. It means that we don't really have a care in the world. We're hardened. And that is not good. So like Habakkuk, we should care and we should grieve. And do we show that in our lives towards others? Do others see that? Or are you callous and hardened? The second is we should ask. We should ask. Habakkuk is rather bold when he asks God the difficult questions. How long? Where are you at? Is he supposed to keep on killing people? And Are you going to allow injustice all this time? He says, why are you slow? Why do you idly look? He's honest. He's honest about his doubts. He's honest of what he's coming up against. And it's okay to have those questions. It's okay to bring them to God. The important thing is that we bring them. We know who to ask, right? We come to God and we lay these before him. When a, when a, when a teacher is not surprised when a student has a question about a difficult subject, but I bet you the teacher doesn't like it when the student never asks those questions, right? Because the teacher never knows. Well, I mean, God knows. But there's a sense of like, how can the teacher help if the student doesn't reach out, right? So it's not bad that we have questions or difficulties. We're finite. God knows that, okay? But he knows who to ask. He goes to God. How many of us go to the amateurs to ask our questions, to ourselves or to others, and we bring our doubts and questions and we don't go to God, I mean, God would know the answer, right? He is the expert. He is God, right? But we don't really treat him as such. We treat him like a Lowe's associate. Uh, you guys ever gone to Lowe's and you guys do maintenance projects and you ask a question about where something's at? That's the problem number one. You ask them. I, I remember Monday I went to go ask about solar salt, like where's solar salt at? One person said, it's in the kitchen appliances. And then the other person's like, it's in the plumbing. And for about 30 minutes, I walked back and forth until I finally found it in the bathroom section. <laughs> and I, I kid you not, it, I was happy when Menards opened, but Menards has the same problem. So, like, it's aggravating when you go there, right? Because they're, <laughs> no offense, but they're amateurs, right? They're not subcontractors. They don't know what they're talking about, most of them, unless they're, like, you know, 50, 60 or older. But, <laughs> but we treat God like that. We treat Michael Lowe's associate. Eh, you know. God doesn't really know what he's talking about. I think I'm just going to go find my way. I'll figure it out. I ain't going to bother asking you. We treat him like that. We don't think God's the expert. I like how C.S. Lewis said it. I'm paraphrasing, but he's like, you know, we argue against God about these things when God's the one who, the one who gave us the minds to argue against him. Kind of puts in perspective who God is and who we are. So we should ask. The important thing is that we should pray to God and bring our doubts to him. Failure to bring our doubts and questions to God is actually a failure to recognize who he is. Because if he is the creator of reality, why would we not ask him? Why would we not come to him? There's a dysfunctional reality there in our lives when we don't bring those to him. But in order to ask, we have to care and grieve, right? We have to actually care about what's going on in order to ask. But furthermore, when we ask, we also have to Learn to what? Be, we should wait. Number three, we should wait and be silent. Yay. Trust me on this one. I understand what it's like to wait and be silent. Okay? I literally couldn't talk all last week. So I understand the difficulty when you have to sit down and not say anything. But nonetheless, that's what Habakkuk does. You see, he is waiting on God. He says in chapter 2, verse 1, I'll take my stamp, my watch post and station myself on the tower. 
and he waits on God's response. So some of us, we care and grieve. Yeah, sure, maybe we'll ask God, but then we come to a hasty conclusion. We don't even wait for God. We ask him, and then we move right on. Okay, I was looking for like a five-minute answer time, God, and you are taking forever, so I'm moving on. You see, doubts and questions are not bad things, but hasty conclusions do no one good. Okay? Doubts and questions are not bad things, but hasty conclusions do no one good. Why do I say this? Because doubts and questions, they spur, they stir up a searching out, a seeking out. The waiting develops a patience. It develops, a, it develops our faithfulness, strengthens us to rely on God. Right? If we instantly got it, right? Especially in our society where we want it now. Someone sends a text message, they need an answer within like two or three seconds. Because if they don't, I'm going to think they're ignoring me. But that's kind of the idea, you know, or, or social media. Didn't, weren't you aware of what happened on social media? Yeah, when did it happen? Like, you know, a week ago? No, an hour ago. It's like, okay, I'm not that fast. <laughs> but that's kind of the idea we think of God. And we have to realize that sometimes our culture or the way we think influences how we expect God to answer. But you see, when we hastily conclude, we're, we're no longer searching out. We're no longer seeking out. We've moved on. You guys ever watch those shows like Psych or Monk or those detective shows? Yeah, they're pretty good. I've been, me and my wife have been getting into Psych lately. It's kind of weird, but it's growing on me. Um, but, you know, these detectives, right, you get the protagonists, like the really goofy, weird people, right? They're always weird. But anyway, like, they're trying to figure out the mystery, Right? And then the police department, every time the police department, right? Always like, case closed, figure it out. It's homicide, it's suicide. Case closed. And then the protagonist is like, no, 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 no. The case is not closed. There's still more to figure out. Because once the police department c- closes the case, they put the evidence away and they don't search anymore. They're done. They don't, they don't seek it out. They don't try to look for the answer anymore. And that's what we do with God when we come to these conclusions. I think of John Lennon or Richard Dawkins. God doesn't exist. Case closed when there's actually more to the picture. So we, it's good to have these doubts and questions, but we need to be careful not to just jump to conclusions, right? Because we are finite. We need to wait and we need to be silent. And that requires time. A lot of us are still waiting on God in this answer. Habakkuk waited a very long time. So number three, we need to wait and be silent. Number four is we should remember. We should remember. What does Habakkuk do before he prays his resolution in verses 17 through 19? He recounts the exodus. He recounts God's good nature. He recounts his splendor, his majesty, his beauty, his glory, right? And that, that, that reflection, he remembers God's past faithfulness to fuel belief in God's future faithfulness. Habakkuk remembers God's past faithfulness to fuel belief in God's future faithfulness. Now, the important thing is that we have to have a working knowledge of who God is. See, Habakkuk knew, because why? Because he read the Old Testament, the laws, and, and the story of the Exodus, right? Now, when we don't know God, it's hard for us to really put our faith in him, right? Because you don't know what you're putting your faith in. When I look at a chair with four legs, I know, I have a working knowledge of it. There's four legs, it's made out of metal. I know I can sit in it, right? I have a working knowledge of it. The strength isn't so much in the faith itself, but the object of the faith, okay? I don't get strength because I believe a broken three-legged chair is going to hold me up. No, I get strength because if if I sit in a four-legged chair, it's going to hold me up. It doesn't matter how much faith I have. If I put myself, my butt in the chair, it's going to hold me, right? That's the idea here is we need a working knowledge. We need to remember who God is. Practically, do you read God's word? You know, a lot of times when I hear people struggle with their faith and, and they're struggling with, how do I overcome the sin? Uh, what, what about this evil and suffering? Like, how do I deal with grief or, or these things? And they don't go to God's word. It's, I don't know where to begin. I'm like, well, well, you don't even know who God is. You haven't even tried. In our Western world, you have the Bible on your phones. We have, I, I have like, you might have several copies. You hear it all the time. You come to Catalyst, you hear it. You go to church, you hear it. You go to small group, you hear it. And yet sometimes we don't even pay attention. And then we complain, God, where are you? God, who are you? But you don't do the work of seeking it out. 
it sets you up for failure when it comes to understanding the problem of suffering and evil. So number four, we need to remember, we should remember. As A.W. Tozer said, um, I, I heard this recently, what comes to our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. Belief in God is such a fundamental part of any worldview. Okay? In this life, you will have to decide what you believe about God. And that will dictate how you live tremendously. It's the way it is, logically. If you don't believe in God, that'll affect the way you live. If you believe in God, that'll affect how you live. So the more you know who God is, the more you can act in accordance, the more you can be maybe encouraged or understand things. And that's a lifelong thing, okay? I study God's word every day in my job, and still, I think to myself, I have so much more to learn, okay? So much more to learn. Number five, <clears throat> we should pray for mercy. We should pray for mercy. So Habakkuk's concerned, right? He's concerned about the justice coming. Like, where, where are you? But then after chapter two, after God recounts what he's going to do to the Babylonians and all at the day of the Lord, Habakkuk's like, oh, I don't need to worry about that coming. It's almost like clicks in his mind. What was I thinking? It's going to come. But what I'm more concerned about now, God, in the midst of your wrath, remember mercy. It's the day of the Lord's coming, right? It's a coming. And most oftentimes when we are confronted with evil or suffering, we pray for their destruction, right? The mass shooter, the sexual abuser, the rapist, the people that wrong us. God, bring their judgment on them now. But Habakkuk says, Lord, in your wrath, remember mercy. What we need to be praying is not for the destruction of the wicked, but for the repentance of the wicked. We see that we shouldn't be so quick to ask for their destruction. Because why? And Second Peter says, God is patient toward you. He desires that none should perish, right? But all should come to repentance. So you think God's not being good, yet in the same breath you're saying, take them down. Kill them. We don't want them anymore. Judge the wicked. But you don't look at yourself and say, that's where I was. That's who I am, right? And my sin, apart from God. All who are proud, right? The, the, the root is the idolatry that led to Babylon and Judah's corruption. The proudness, the I can be God. I can decide what's right. So when we are confronted with evil and suffering, we should grieve, right? We should grieve for the sinner, the people who do those things, the mass shooters, the sexual abusers, we, all those people that we see or the people in our life that hurt us, we should be praying for mercy for them, that they would, be, they would repent before God. That's how we need to be praying. That's what Habakkuk says in, in chapter 3, verse 2. In wrath, remember mercy. In wrath, remember mercy. As much as we will want to demand justice and judgment now in the wicked and wrongdoing, don't forget God's attribute of mercy and love. And then number six, we should rejoice. And this is probably the most difficult, confusing one. We should rejoice. Peter talks about it. James talks about it. The New Testament's full of it. Rejoice in the midst of your suffering and trial. Why is that important? Because it shows that your treasure, your joy, isn't based on the circumstances of this life. Okay? Okay? When the world sees you suffer, it says, why are they so happy? Where's their joy at? What do they treasure beyond this world? It's a powerful testimony. The world needs to see rejoicing and joy in the midst of great sorrow and difficulty. The beauty of Christianity is that it's practical and glorious, okay? It, it doesn't turn a blind eye to evil and suffering, pretending it doesn't exist, and neither is it so despairing and gloomy that it can't have any joy in this life or a faith in the world to come. You know, one of the things, and I don't mean to harp too much on Christian movies, but I feel like it is practical. You know, I'm not saying anything bad about all of them, okay? But I actually, you know, reading God's, watching God's Not Dead or War Room, I read some secular reviews on their movies. And I was curious. I wanted to know, 
Are they offended by the gospel message or the method? You know what each reviewer said about each movie? They don't know what real life is. And how can it really speak to me then? Because in some of those movies, it portrays this idea of everything's really okay. The world's not as bad as it maybe is. Or if you turn to Jesus, everything just gets better. That's the prosperity gospel, right? All the preachers that come and say, hey, all your suffering, all your financial debt, gone instantly if you trust in Jesus. That's, a, that's not real, though. That's not what we experience, <laughs> okay? Maybe look like what it is in the tabloids. But we experience true suffering. And so when we acknowledge it and we say, yeah, things are bad, things aren't good, but then we rejoice in the midst of it, that catches the world's attention. I think of Corey Ten Boom in the concentration camps singing and praising God. Okay, if you want to know what hell on earth is, you can read about the concentration camps. Most of us know that, right? It is literally hell on earth, the torturing. There, there's things that they did that I, I can't even speak now. It's so horrendous, okay? Yet she rejoiced, and people saw that. The Nazi soldiers saw that. When Dietrich Bonhoeffer was imprisoned, a, a, a pastor in Nazi Germany who, who attempted to stand up to Hitler, right? He was imprisoned, but he was so full of joy that the, the, the guards, he won them over. They played card games. They, they talked and laughed. He, he had such an exuberant joy in the midst of his suffering that the world said, what is that? When Paul was being beaten and hurt all throughout that time, every one of the disciples being murdered, martyred. And Paul says, I am filled with inexpressible joy. In fact, he's so filled with joy that he wants those people around him to experience so badly that he says, I wish I would go to hell so others would have it. What, what does he see? What is that? That's a powerful witness. Because in the midst of evil and suffering, we want Christianity to stand out as the truth it is, right? Now the ultimate question, and I want to end on this. I'm going to run a little over, but I want to end on this. I know you guys are thinking, okay, nice six application points, but okay, the question though is, how does God use evil and injustice for a greater good? Still don't feel like you've answered that. And here's, here's oh, no, I'm going to say something about it. But I do want to say, I can't explain it all in like the next two minutes, okay? It is, it is something that we won't always fully comprehend because we're finite and God's ways are higher than our ways. But I do want to say this. Look at the cross. Was there ever a greater injustice than the killing of Jesus Christ? The creator of reality was there ever a grief like Jesus, as George Herbert would say? Was there ever a grief like his? Was there ever an injustice? The creature killing the creator, the greatest cosmic treason we've ever known. But guess what? What did he do through that? I look at myself. I was saved because of that. So you wonder, how can God take something so horrible and horrendous like the cross, and turn it now, what is it? A symbol of hope. Some of you have it on a necklace. Some of you has a tattoo. It's on the church buildings. It's postered in the books, right? Something that was so evil and unjust was now repurposed by God for the glorious salvation of the church. And that's what is offered to us. So if you ever doubt, I don't know if God is good, if he can really use evil and injustice, look at the cross. Look at your own self. We were rebellious and sinful, yet he repurposed us to be his church, to be his bride, to be a friend to Jesus. The darkest act of evil in the history of mankind was repurposed by God to bring about the most glorious act of salvation. That's how great God is. I may not understand every time the specific acts of evil and injustice that we encounter, how he uses it. But I know if he could use that, surely he can redeem all things for his glory. 
that we don't need to count these afflictions as greater than they are compared to the glory that will be revealed at the end of time. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. Thank you for your message in Habakkuk. Pray that we would be encouraged by your love and that we would help us to learn to be patient, to wait on you, not to doubt your goodness, um, but to look to the cross, the gospel of Jesus Christ, saved by your blood, saved by the sacrifice of your son, Jesus Christ. We pray this in his name. Amen. Mm-hmm.